Hi. Hi, Scott. All right. Hello, everyone. Um, my name is Michael Saladino. Um, I am on the board of the IGDA Leadership Forum, so I have the honor of introducing myself. <laughs> um, so, my name is Michael Saladino. Uh, just to give you a real quick background on me, uh, I'm a programmer by trade, got into the business back in 93, um, worked at a lot of small independent companies like Parallax, uh, Volition, Mobius, Presto Studios. Um, ended up going over to Microsoft because I wanted to find out how games were made. Ain't that right, Jesse? <laughs> Um, went there, this is like Xbox days, and 360 was still called Xenon and, you know, was in prototype hardware in a, inside of a Macintosh, funny enough. And uh, I was there for a couple of years, um, and then I took a job over at uh, Electronic Arts and officially hung up my compiler and became a full-time team leader, uh, starting as a development director and then eventually becoming an executive producer of the Mercenary, uh, Mercenaries franchise. Um, after the uh, pandemic went away, um, I ended up uh, looking around and trying to figure out what do I want to do next. Um, I started up my own thing called Mercury Games, which it says on my badge. But right now, I actually work full-time at Riot Games. So that's my background. Um, what I focus on is large-scale team leadership and expansion. I deal with a lot of issues of scale. Um, for those of you who know something about Riot Games, we have issues of scale. Um, Scaling the culture, scaling process, scaling people, scaling tech. Everything is growing very, very rapidly. And that actually is kind of what's behind what I'm going to be talking about here, the danger of redlining your team. And what I mean by redlining is that 100% capacity push, that intrinsic desire that all leaders naturally have to see that Gantt chart filled. You know, or even if you're using Agile and you're using Scrum, you want to see the Scrum board filled. If your uh, historicals tell you that this team completes 73 story points every two weeks, come on, guys, 81? What are you gonna, Come on, you know, let, let's go for it. And there's some good stuff there, but there's also some bad, and we're going to talk about that. So let's go through what the overall goals we're going to cover. First thing is we're going to talk about some classic models of development. And I'm going, to take, I'm going to take us all the way back to the 19th century. So have a little historical trip. Then I'm going to propose a hypothesis, this idea of where we might be able to go into the future. Now, I am not proposing something that my big brain invented. Okay, What I'm going to talk about is not something that's new. But I will say it's still experimental. There's not a lot of companies that are using what I'm going to propose. So what I'm going to challenge all you with is, how can you take this idea back to your company and try to experiment with it as well? Because I do believe that the 21st century of project management and product development is going to look a lot like my hypothesis. We're going to talk about queuing theory. Um, not too much. I won't dive too far into the math behind this, but I will give you a rough outline, which is the, uh, the foundation of what I'm going to be talking about. I'm going to have real-world examples. We all like that, right? Get out of the theoretical land and say, hey, this is how you can actually see it. And then finally, what you can do tomorrow. Okay, not tomorrow. Tomorrow you're here at the IGDA. But what you can do on Monday, literally start doing in order to run this experiment. All right? Sound fun? Oh, yeah. Yeah. And as you notice, I'm not a podium person, so I'm going to be walking around as I can as long as the clicker keeps working. Okay, so um, the overarching theme here is the difference between what is a top-down solution versus a bottom-up solution. I seriously doubt anyone in this room needs this explained, but I will. <laughs> a top-down solution is when you have a hierarchy and someone at the top of the hierarchy says, I have an idea and here's how we're going to execute on it, and they push instructions down the hierarchy until it finally gets to workers who do the things that they've been told to do. Top-down, simple enough. Bottom-up, the opposite of that where you hope that people at the bottom are coming up with ideas, executing on them, and bubbling up that value to the overall business. It's bottom-up. Simple. So let's start with the godfather of top-down. This is Frederick Taylor. Um, and this man was a big deal back in the 19th century because um, he introduced a really radical idea. Let's apply the scientific method to the manufacturing process. Okay, this is mid-19th century. 
All right, this is the Industrial Revolution. This is textiles and making widgets. All right, this was the first time the world had ever seen something like this. And people were unsure as how to do it. Taylor came up and said, okay, wait a minute. The scientific method that's been around since 15th, 16th century, at this point it was old, 200, 300 years. You know, you got Newton, you know, you got Descartes. Um, these guys were like, hey, it, it, this is solving chemistry. This is solving the natural world. And he said, well, why can't we use the scientific method and apply it to man-made creations? Business. So that's what he did. And one of the first things he decided was, we have to separate the work. And the way he separated it was, here are the people who plan, and here are the people who execute. Now, the people who plan, these are very smart people. They have college degrees. They have PhDs. They wear white lab coats. Okay, these were the brains of the organization. And an organization that, say, did manufacturing of textiles or, um, you know, made buggies back in those times, um, they would make up one, maybe 2% of the company. And they're the smart people. Now, the other 98, 99% of the company, they were the low-skilled to no-skilled workers. They were stupid. This is how Taylorism viewed the world. This is the perspective. And the idea was is that by hiring very, very smart people to do the planning, they could develop perfection. The scientific method um, was teaching people to view the world as a clockwork universe, okay? Where as long as you understand all the pieces and the drivers going into it, you can perfectly predict what will happen. And that's what he wanted to capture. So he said, let's hire all these really smart people, have them do all this planning, make them create perfection on paper, and then they will hand this over to workers, and then they will execute and create perfection. That's the theory. Okay. So what that basically did, I'll start with one of the core problems, that created 1% or 2% of the company were effectively gods. They were infallible. And the other 98% of the organization was filled with people who could neither add nor subtract because they had perfection in their hand. All they had to do was execute it. They couldn't make it any better. It's perfect. They shouldn't make it any worse. That's a defect. So basically, it turns 98% of your company into people who just fuck things up. So what do you do? You hire a bunch of fucking angry managers, floor men, who are fucking yelling at you. And it's three minutes past your coffee ba break, Brian. Get back to work. You know, this was how they drove manufacturing. We've, I'm sure we've all read Upton Sinclair's The Jungle. <laughs> Taylorism. That's what it was. Now... There are problems with tail Taylorism, as I just mentioned, but let's be very clear, every tool has its place. Taylorism gets shit done. Empire State Building. Empire State Building, from beginning to end, from the moment they began demolishing the four buildings that were in that thing's footprint to the moment the first tenant started moving in, 20 months. How long does it take our generation to build a skyscraper. Taylorism gets shit done. Damn. <laughs> or how about this? Who here has actually been to the Hoover Dam? The Hoover Dam is one of those things, <laughs> I'm sure you'll agree with me, it's like the Grand Canyon. No picture ever expresses what it is. Something is lost in the photographic process that causes you to go, wow, that looks big. Until you get there and go, holy shit. I can't believe someone built this. Oh, and here's a question for you. How many computers were used making this? Zero. This is paper and pencil and brawn. That's badass. Taylorism gets shit done. Now, what is unique about these things? Why does Taylorism work so well in this scenario? Well, it's complex. It's definitely complex. However, it's highly certain. And that's very different than what we do, making video games, which is also complex, but it's highly uncertain. This stuff, very certain. When they started building this thing, they knew how much concrete they were going to use. They knew how much steel. They knew how tall it was going to be. They understood how much water it was going to have to support. They understood all this stuff. It didn't change radically during the construction. And also, when they started building this hydroelectric dam, 
They didn't get halfway through, get really creative and go, let's make it a skyscraper. <laughs> that wouldn't have worked. Who here realizes that Halo started as an RTS? Blew your mind. <laughs> yeah, Halo started as a goddamn RTS. What did it turn into? A genre-defining console shooter experience. They did turn Hoover Dam into the Empire State Building, and God bless them for doing so, because it made my life a better. <laughs> so that's what Taylorism is great at. When certainty is high, even when complexity is high, Taylorism can get shit done. Now, this is bouncing around. Here is a, one of my favorite uh, pictures that I stumbled into. This is an early Gantt chart. This is actually for the Empire State Building. And down below the bottom, you see dates, months. And here are actually the floors as they're being constructed. And the five lines that you see zigzagging up are things like, we ordered the steel, the steel gets made, the steel is delivered, the steel is in place. An early Gantt chart, all right? Here's something for the Hoover Dam. This is Taylorism at work. Very smart people, planners, that are putting, effectively, perfection on paper in order to hand it over to that guy. Or those two people. These guys on the Hoover Dam. I have difficulty looking at that picture. Um, other than the fact that these workers were obviously insane um, for working this way, um, what this demonstrates is the hard line that Taylorism created between the planning, the smart people, the perfection, and the execution. So, what kind of problems are generated from top down? I've already talked about some of them, but let's, let me try to frame them in, in video game terms. Managers telling people what to do. In a highly certain environment, with top-down solutions, a manager telling you what to do every hour of every day makes a lot of sense. But in a highly uncertain environment where your manager, like this man here, Mr. Danker, who manages a bunch of engineers who are in the code, but he's not in the code, is he in a very good position to tell them what to do on an hour-by-hour -hour basis? The distance of the manager from the chaos of that uncertainty means that he probably shouldn't be telling people what to do. And he definitely does not know what is best. And here's what I was talking about earlier. In that scenario, managers who are responsible for uh, costs and the finance of projects, they love to see maximum workload. They love to crank everything to 100%, sometimes even beyond, and go, look at how much money I'm saving. <laughs> but the result ends up being very, very brittle. Okay, that is one of the inherent flaws of a top-down solution. The resulting product, whether it's a skyscraper or a dam or a top-down de developed video game, it is incredibly brittle. It does not adapt to change any more than the hydroelectric dam knows how to become a skyscraper. It's brittle. And sadly enough, our educational system is constructed in such a way to reinforce top-down methodologies and that brittleness. Um, it's been 20 so years since I was in grade school, but I would bet if I went back there, it would look pretty damn similar to what it looked like back then. Got 30 kids all lined up in rows, sitting down, looking in one direction, and the floor manager on the other end, standing up, telling them what to do. We ingrain that thinking into people throughout K through 12, and sadly into some universities even. So the fact that video game people for years have gravitated towards top-down solutions. That's not an accident. That's just a natural result of our culture and the way we teach children. So I like to think of uh, <laughs> top-down solutions as very Rube Goldbergian. This is brittle, all right? Any little thing goes wrong and the whole thing collapses, all right? Think of it like this, you know, every little piece of a big complex thing has a tolerance, you know? How much weight can it support? You know, how much kinetic energy can it absorb? And one little thing starts going out of whack and starts vibrating too much. And that kinetic energy begins spreading to the things around it. And then they start going out of whack. And then spreading out from there. And it spider webs out until you have a catastrophic failure. Catastrophic failure is a, is a direct result of a brittle, top-down, monolithic system. 
Who's ever seen that great video of that bridge that sways back and forth in the wind? That's a great example of a catastrophic failure in a top-down system. You know, when something like this fails, you know, in this scenario, I don't think too much is going to go wrong. But in a building, the thing falls. Buildings collapse. Bridges collapse. A space shuttle blows up. That's the catastrophic failure that you get in a top-down solution. Bottom-up solutions tend to be much more flexible and are able to absorb change that comes through the system. They're more sustainable over the long term. All right. We're going to do a quick little exercise here. All right? So, actually, I'm trying to think. Did I steal this from Clinton Keith, Mike Cohen, or Mary Papadnik? I'm not sure. <laughs> You're probably going to recognize it. Okay. This is what I'd like to see you guys do. Everyone stand up. <laughs> All right. Microphone working again? Excellent. Okay. The hell was that? Any, anyone have any thoughts on what that quick little exercise um, might be pointing out? Jesse? Yeah, it's kind of a top down. Good luck. <laughs> if you try to do a top down with that, good luck. Scott? Very difficult to control complex systems with one instruction. Mm, that's, that's often very true. Yes? <laughs> okay, she hacked the system. I like that. If you're not cheating, you're not trying hard. Yes? So you guys are definitely hitting on um, some of the key points here. And, yeah, could I have solved that? So, um, excuse me, Elizabeth? Hi, right. my name is Michael. Hi, Michael. Hi, nice to meet you. Um, could you tell me who your best friend and worst enemies were? You were my best friend. Um, I thought you were my worst enemy. Excellent. Uh, Anne, hi, Michael Saladino. Hi. hi. Uh, who was your best friend and worst enemy? You were also my best friend. <laughs> so, <laughs> so, I continue doing this. I go around the entire room. How many people are in this room? But there's got to be 70, 80 people, right? Something like that. Um, I go around and I collect all that information. And you know, because I'm a manager, I go back into my uh, office, also known as my manager cage. And with all the powers of Microsoft Office at my disposal, even, even PowerPoint, <laughs> how long does it take me to solve that? To solve what you guys solve? Weeks. <laughs> it's probably an in, it's probably an NP complete problem. Um, yeah, I mean, this is not something I'd be able to do. In fact, because I am an ex engineer, probably what I would do is bust out a quick scripting language and actually simulate what you guys just did as the most optimal way to solve this thing. And it is. It's about complexity. Um, as you notice, um, sometimes uh, when you do the first instruction, um, it doesn't, it does not collapse. It doesn't stabilize. It's because there are cyclic loops that are going on there. But guess what? By just watching that go, I was able to pick out the people that I had that I would have to go to and go. Okay, you stop. You know, you cut those dependencies. You get out of there and cut a few dependencies, and all of a sudden the thing co uh, collapses and stabilizes. You know, complexity is a big part of why bottom-up solutions are needed. And uncertainty is another part of why it's needed. So the fact that you guys are able to solve those problems in a very rapid period of time, minutes, as opposed to me spending hours, days, weeks trying to solve this thing, um, that's the demonstration of what bottom-up really can achieve. And it's about giving very simple guidelines to people to manage uncertainty. You know, for any of you that have used Scrum, Scrum is a very short set of rules. And they're there in order to help control the uncertainty that's inevitably occurring on your team. And then finally, the feedback loops that were happening out there. You know, if there are 
80 people in this room and all of you had two dependencies to other people, it's a spider web of interlocking dependencies, all of which were affecting everything else. Me trying to solve that on my own, pointless. You guys with a couple simple rules and the feedback loop of being able to simply look at the other person and make second by second updates and, and small course corrections, that's the right way to solve the problem. So that's what bottom up is all about. And when we're talking about bottom up solutions, if uh, Taylor is the father of top down, well this man Deming is gonna be the father of the bottom up solution. Uh, Deming came on the scene back in the 40s and 50s um, and he was looking around and you know, seeing how the industrial revolution was progressing and he said, you know, something's going to occur here. Um, uh, Peter Drucker, if you've ever read his work, very much in the same boat. And he started saying, we have to start leveraging the totality of the system. And by system, he meant all the people at your company. He looked at that division of labor, of that one or two percent of smart people that create perfection and the other 99, 98 percent of people who try not to screw it up. He said, this is ridiculous. We're leaving huge amounts of value on the table. We need to leverage the totality of the system. We need every single person in the organization to have some ability to get involved in the planning. And he also said, let's separate the work differently. He said, don't do execution and planning. Bad idea. Because it actually cuts a feedback loop. If I plan something, and in fact I planned it wrong, but someone else does it, I never realized that I made a mistake in the planning, and therefore I don't learn. He said, ridiculous. So let's combine those two things. And instead what we want to do is an organization that defines this is what we want to build and this is why it is important. Goal-based management. The how is actually now a combination of execution and planning. Okay? So you have, say, one or two percent of the company that defines what we're going to build and why it's important to the business. And they hand that over to the other 98, 99 percent of the business and say, go figure this thing out. Do all the planning you need to do and then execute in whatever way you think is appropriate in order to make sure that you achieve the goal. Much like telling a bunch of Marines, take that hill. Here's why we want you to take that hill. But guess what? We're not going to tell you what to do to actually get there because conditions on the ground are going to be changing every couple minutes. You can't prep them for it. So they improvise. They get very agile. And he was also a big believer in cross-disciplinary teams. Um, under Taylorism, um, in order to maximize economies of scale, they tended to group people in large monolithic departments. Um, in classic video games, that would be if you had a giant engineering department, and a giant art department, and a giant design department, and a giant QA department, and they talked to each other through memos. You know, sent through pneumatic tubes in order to make it really old. I'm sure many of you, if you've been in the business long enough, have worked at a company that behaved that way. I pray to God none of you are, are still working at a company that behaves that way. I hope we finally have crossed that tipping point and everyone knows giant monolithic departmental organizations are disasters. You want cross-disciplinary teams. The idea being that you want to bring together different people with different perspectives from the different disciplines in order to solve the uncertainty of what you're trying to do. If you uh, imagine it back in the uh, construction worker term, you know, the electricians don't have to know what the plumbers are doing. You know, the plumbers don't necessarily have to know what the bricklayers are doing. Okay? Each of them have their separate plans and they can basically work autonomously. That's not true when you're talking about a great, big, complex, uncertain thing. So what he envisioned was something that looks like it's out of an HR manual. He envisioned this idea of a bunch of different people coming together in order to solve a problem. He envisioned something that looks like us, apparently, of continual learning and teaching. He envisioned something that looked like this, Clinton, of two programmers sitting side by side and working on some big, scary problem. He envisioned what is now known as the knowledge worker. Who here is familiar with the expression the knowledge worker? Okay. We're all knowledge workers, just in case you aren't aware of this. Um, the knowledge worker was the great uh, creation of the 20th century and will continue to be a major driver. Um, you know, for all of us that, you know, really love reading about the economic news um, and unemployment and all these horrible things, 
uh, it's unfortunately the blue collar manufacturing stuff that's more in line with Taylorism that has taken a complete beating. And those are the guys who are really in trouble. So the knowledge worker is us in video games. And the knowledge worker is defined by six basic ideas. The first, what is the task? A knowledge worker asks himself, what is the task? What do I do next? Classic Taylorism, you get told what to do next. No knowledge worker should get told what to do next. That's your job. You figure out what to do next. You know your goal, so how are you going to achieve it? And you ask that of yourself and of the team around you. Knowledge workers are also self-managing. One of the, you know, one thing that I see a lot is, you know, a young manager will say something like, uh, you know, that engineer Bob, I don't see him at his desk very much, and when he is, he's usually talking to other people, and I don't know, it's like he's having too much fun. I, I'm concerned that he's not working hard enough. And I'm always like, is he getting his shit done? Are his goals being achieved when he said they were going to be achieved? Yeah. Why do you care then? Maybe he works from home. Maybe he's incredibly fast at programming. Maybe he spends a lot of his time blue skying in his head and then just becomes a font of code for an hour a day and that's how he achieves success. Who cares how he does it? He is self-managing. He manages his own time. The other day, I had, a, I had an engineer come up to me. Um, I was actually giving this exact talk at Riot. Um, and we, inv we invited the entire company. Said, hey, everyone, come on down to Earth, our big communal space. Come on down and watch Michael Saladino make a fool of himself and talk about crazy shit. <laughs> and he came over to me and he said, I really want to come down and see this, but I'm working on something. And I'm like, okay, well, you can come down if you want. He's like, well, should I? I'm like, I don't know. <laughs> You know if you should come downstairs. You know if you're about to blow a sprint for your team and therefore you shouldn't. Or, no, I can work an extra hour this evening to make this thing up. You know. I can't tell you what to do. But that is so common. Again, top down, our fucking educational system. It is so common, especially for young kids coming straight out of school, to have that mentality. It's like, no, I don't manage you. I don't micromanage your time. You need to be able to manage yourself. Key element of being a knowledge worker. And quite frankly, it's one of the reasons why I'm glad I am one. Key, innovation is part of the work. This goes back to um, Taylorism and the idea of the worker. He can't add any more to it because it's already perfect. All he can do is make a mistake and subtract from it, in which case he gets penalized. There really is no upside for a worker in Taylorism. But a knowledge worker in a bottom-up organization we demand innovation. If a uh, guy who works for uh, cars, uh, the Ford, say, and he makes Tauruses. Do we still make Tauruses? No. Okay. What do we make now? <laughs> Focus? Okay. He's making Foci. <laughs> and he comes in, and his team has a really creative day. And by the end of the day, they built a Ferrari. Will they be rewarded for this at the Ford dealership? I'm like, what the hell is this? Why do we now have a Ferrari? <laughs> we don't have any system to sell this thing. We've got to put it on eBay. <laughs> Stop it. Don't make more Ferraris. Make Foci. <laughs> All right? But guess what? In our business, knowledge workers, video games, you're damn straight. If I tell you to go build a Focus, you come back with a Ferrari? <laughs> Bonus. <laughs> well done, Bob. I like you. You keep doing that? Promotion. Flying up the ladder. Superstar. Rock star of your organization. Why? He turns Foci into Lamborghinis. <laughs> the innovation has to be part of the work. And this is a big part of the key idea of what's wrong about redlining your team. When you redline your team, this is the thing that starts getting hurt the most. Innovation begins draining out of the system because people are in too much of a hurry to be innovative. So the next item is what we're doing here, continuous learning, continuous teaching. Think of it like this, you know, if your job was to lift up heavy things and move them across the dock, you probably shouldn't get weak. Simple enough. 
if your job is knowledge, you shouldn't get dumb. How do you prevent getting dumb? By learning, continuously learning, always challenging yourself to learn something new, always read something new, always go to a new blog, buy books by the truckload, do whatever you need to do, continuously learn. And the flip side, once you learn something, you teach it to someone. I don't care who it is, but you go and you teach it to someone because that's the best way to solidify the thing you just learned in your own mind. And that creates a virtuous cycle, a positive feedback loop of continuous learning and continuous teaching. Very powerful for growing a knowledge working team. The fifth item is, in the bottom up organization, quality finally caught up and in some cases exceeded quantity. If you're a worker in Taylorism, how do people know if you're doing a good job? Well, they count the number of wheels you put on axles in a given hour. If the number goes up, you're doing better. Number goes down, what the hell's wrong with you? Or lug nuts on a, on a wheel or number of engines put in chassis. You're judged by quantity and often defect rates. Um, but in the knowledge worker, quality becomes much more important. And whether or not the individual is able to hold the quality bar of the innovations that they are bringing to bear. Uh, and then finally, a knowledge worker needs to be considered as an asset, not a cost. And this is probably the trickiest of all six of these in uh, the current state of our industry and really almost any knowledge worker industry. And this goes back to the fact that uh, how many of you uh, do P&Ls? Okay. Profit and loss charts. You know, you're running a project, and you need to figure out whether or not this thing is going to be profitable. So you put all of the revenues that you are making or are going to make, predictively, in one column, and you put all the losses, all your expenditures, in the other. Where does the knowledge worker go in a P&L? Their loss. The fact that finance has not come up with a proper model to reflect the knowledge worker, I think, is one of the great failings in not just the games industry, but across all industries of knowledge workers. Because the reason I think that that's so horrible is what that does is when you have a large organization, I won't name names, you have a large organization and all of a sudden accountants and stock portfolios start getting shaky and dropping and horrible things like that, what's the first thing they want to do? Cut expenditures. What's the most expensive part of a knowledge company? You. What do they do? They lay off a 1,000 of you with no concept, with no appreciation, without any real thinking as to the knowledge worker as an asset. They simply look at a studio over here and go, well, that'll save us 80 million. <laughs> so these are the six elements that make up the modern knowledge worker. And the knowledge worker is the fundamental piece of the bottom-up organization, which, like I said, Deming started talking about back in the 40s and 50s. Um, the, sad, the sad reality of that was uh, Deming, obviously, uh, he's an American, American business thinker. Uh, he found that no one in America cared about what he was telling them in, back in the 50s and into the 60s. Um, and there was a very good reason for that. Um, a lot of people think that you know, 50s and 60s were a boom time in America um, because you know, any number of reasons of exceptionalism and you know, fun words like that um, in the 1950s and 1960s, every other major Western country had been bombed into oblivion by World War II. We were the only game in town. That, more than anything, was the primary driver behind the economic explosion that happened in America post-World War II. We were it. So they didn't care about things like high quality, low inventory rates, you know, speed to customers or things like that. They were just like, flip everything to 100 and run as fast as you can, and I guarantee everything you build will be sold, and people will be happy with it because they have no other choice. Well, what happened with that model? Well, the 1970s showed up, and then the 1980s showed up. <laughs> and suddenly we realized that we had lost a big part of the manufacturing run. The next game is now here, and it's the knowledge worker. We got to make sure we don't lose that one too, because this is the 21st century. So I'm going to ask the question. We now have a new model. We have the bottom up. We have Deming and Drucker and all this fun stuff. Now we have people 
collaborating with the planning as well as the execution. We have product owners and scrum masters. Is that it? Have we now reached the end of optimizing the solution? Or is there something more we can do? Well, managers still control the what and the why at most companies. And by control, I'm saying 90, 95%, probably all the way up to 100% in some organizations. They control, this is what we're going to build, and here's why it's important. Well, this tends to make managers who focus on direct value to the player. New features, new game modes, new maps. They tend to focus very heavily on that kind of stuff. But they ignore the indirect value. And what I mean by indirect value is, how many of you know the term technical debt? How many of you have technical debt? Product owners in the traditional uh, scrum mold have a tendency to focus almost entirely on direct player value, and so they should. They're called product owners. Their goal is to focus on delivering value as fast as they can to the player. And usually that comes in the form of do something new, do something new, do something new. What they leave often is the indirect value, which is burning down technical debt, making sure that workflows are more effective, making sure that people can, can get their creativity to the player as fast as possible, which to the player, they don't even notice it until nine months later, and they appreciate something that they really don't ever see, which is your internal velocity. Managers still love 100% allocation, even in Scrum. You know, like I was saying, managers still love to push those numbers up and push them up. Um, I actually have, have seen some people when they adopt Scrum and, and start tracking story points and have velocity charts, it's basically the gamification of work. And I can see them lose track of what they actually are trying to do, and they just want the number to go up. Oh, my God, I want the number to go up. Oh, I've got to reach level 12. It's weird, but I've seen it. I see it a lot. It's a, real, it's a real bear trap that people fall into. And then if they can't get their beloved 100%, they love splitting people between teams, which is a big no-no in Scrum, and yet managers always kind of eyeball and say, well, why don't I just put this person, he's only half-filled over here, so why don't I put him also on this team? Now he's at 100%. Ah. <laughs> now I can sleep. <laughs> and then the final point here is managers are still often making these decisions and they're out of the trenches. All right? They're still making decisions about what and why and allocation of resources, even though, like I said, they're removed from the problem, sometimes one or even two orders of removal from the people doing the work, living with the uncertainty on every single day. I'm just asking the question here. Are we leaving something on the table with this model? Can we empower the totality of the system, in Deming's words, across what and why, and not just how. I don't know. So bottom-up solutions extreme. What might this look like? This is the hypothesis. Like I said, I have invented nothing here. This is simply something I've noticed by studying other companies and some experiments I've done on my own, uh, looking to uh, share some of these ideas with you guys. Let's give people the taste of the power of what and why. Spread that out from that core one, two, three percent of top managers defining that and start sharing what we're going to build and why it's important with more of the organization. This will drive entrepreneurial spirit. Now, this is a buzz phrase. Hell, I heard this at a lot of companies that do not have entrepreneurial spirit. Absolutely, positively did not. I remember uh, listening to a GM every damn conversation for a month he was talking about how do we, and you know, how do we, I believe he actually used the word enforce, uh, entrepreneurialism. <laughs> wow. <laughs> but if you, if you instead had a culture and reinforced by some basic processes that allow you to spread around the what are we going to build and why it's important, will that allow people to themselves start gravitating towards their own natural tendencies to be entrepreneurial? And does that then create emergent brilliance? Creations that never would have shown up if you just let the 10 smartest guys in the company sit in a conference room and talk for a few days. Never would have shown up. 
Because instead, can we set up a culture and a process that allows a thousand people the opportunity at this? Can we do that? And can we empower that through career mentorship? Can we encourage people to reach these self-transcendent goals? Self-transcendent needs to be a key element of a bottom-up organization. What that means is for you to ask them to build the Focus, and instead they build the Ferrari. Self-transcendence. You ask them to do something, and they go, I'll do 10 times that. And I'm not talking about amount of work. I'm talking about coolness of work, brilliance of work. Can we get them to do that? Can we break them out of the top-down, educationally trained system that they know and love, get them out of that, and start really turning all the individuals in your organization into little businessmen? Or do we even want to? This is the idea. So, my theory is you start by giving people time. And this goes directly to my point of why running people to 100% capacity is so damaging. They have no time. None. So, I said I would talk a little bit about queuing theory. Uh, this is a, a branch of mathematics that studies work moving through a system. Now, that's, very, uh, uh, that's a very theoretical statement. Um, but to put a little weight behind it, um, if you wanted to understand why the uh, checkout lines in your local grocery store were dysfunctional, you would study queuing theory. And then it would tell you what is wrong with the checkout lines in your local grocery store. Now, one of the key ideas in queuing theory is something called Little's Law. And simple ideas <coughs> is the time it takes for a piece of work to get through the system is equal to the number of things in process divided by average completion rates. Um, like I said, I don't want to dive into the mathematics and the theory of this stuff. Um, but I will say what queuing theory and Little's Law eventually get you to is something called the utilization paradox. Now, this is a very, very interesting graph. You'll see on the bottom axis the idea of capacity. Okay, so 0% capacity, meaning no one does anything, all the way up to 100% capacity on the other end of the graph. This means everyone is fully tasked. And then on the y-axis, you have cycle time. And what cycle time means is how long does it take a piece of work to go from the beginning to the end? to go from an idea to your player thinking, wow, that's badass. That's cycle time. Now, you'll notice something about this graph. If you're in you know, the 10, 25, 50% range, increasing capacity doesn't really do anything for your cycle time. Cycle time remains relatively consistent. But you notice as you go above 50 to 60 to 75 to 80 to 90, all the curves reach some point and go hockey stick and start jutting up rapidly. They reach a tipping point where adding additional capacity to the team is actually now slowing everyone down because it can't absorb the additional capacity effectively, efficiently. The basic idea here is, is that all complex systems require a certain amount of slack in order to remain highly efficient. All right? So, pretty theoretical, sure. But how about a real world example? This is Los Angeles, right? Obama comes to town. Yeah! <laughs> Yay! 100% capacity! <laughs> this is what 100% capacity looks like on a freeway system. This is what 100% capacity would look like with checkout lines at your local store. Anything that's about cues, working, you know, work moving through a system, as you approach 100%, you, and you don't know where it is, you don't know if it's at 50 or 60 or 80 or 90, but I promise you, somewhere in there, there will be a moment where you hit a tipping point and the whole thing goes to hell. Instead, you want a free way to look like that because every one of those people is driving a very happy 70 miles an hour. This is a freeway that operates at a very high efficiency rate because it is not being overly stressed. Let me give you another real-world example. So Google, this was probably 10 years ago or more by this point, Google uh, released a white paper that I read um, way back then where, you know, this was before Google was Google and they were just a funny little search engine. I, I, I'll use Yahoo instead. Um, 
And they released this great white paper explaining um, some studies they had done uh, on their server load and internet traffic. And they, they studied it, and believe me, I read through this thing, or at least I tried. The math was so advanced, it completely lost me. Um, however, I did you know, grind all the way to the end, and the last like, couple paragraphs, it was great. After all that math, the last couple paragraphs came down to, and so we've decided that uh, servers really start slowing down after 80% utilization, so from now on, whenever we go above that, we're going to buy more servers. And that was it. That was the outcome of this really in-depth study. And it's true. <laughs> you know, anyone here who has ever dealt with servers, any rioters in the room or, hi, Jesse, <laughs> we know through real-world experience, if you ever allow your servers to reach that kind of capacity, they're going to fall over. They're going to slow down, and they're going to fall. You know, if you have, if you have boxes that run your game servers, and you load test it, and you decide that you can run 280 game servers on one piece of hardware. You don't. You scale it back to, like, 180 and enjoy the headroom. Buy another machine. They're cheap in comparison. So this is another real-world example of the utilization paradox. If you push a system too hard, it will freeze up and fall over. Redlining your team is the same thing. Your team will freeze up, and it will fall over, and it will be the opposite of agile. It will be brittle. So the first element here was let's free up some extra time, right? But here's the trick. A lot of people stop at this point. They go, okay, well, if they just need to work at 80% capacity, we'll just slow them down. We'll slow them down 20%. When they do their sprint planning, instead of doing uh, 80 story points, I'll just slow them down to 70 Solved, right? I actually witnessed this exact dialogue. Funniest shit I've ever seen. Manager comes in and says, we need Slack, so we're going to reduce our velocity by 20%. Or he said, we're going to hire four more engineers. It was one of those two things. Executive, well, what are they going to do instead? I don't know, but they're going to do something. <laughs> Get out. <laughs> I swear to God, funny as shit. Um, you can't just say slow down. That's meaningless. Okay, we're human beings. We all know how human beings work. If I tell you that your term paper is due in two weeks, when do you work on the term paper? Night before. Two weeks minus one day. All right? We're human beings. The way we operate is the work you give us is like a gas. It fills the volume in which we are given. Always does. Okay, tons of studies on this. Wish we could change it, but we're human beings and it's just the way we are. So don't fight natural human tendency. Instead, say, okay, well, let's slow you down, but then let's also fill that space up with something. Just so the other 80% doesn't naturally just flow into the vacuum, which it will. Instead, fill up the other 20% with something. You must do real work in that extra 20 Okay? It can't be learn kayaking. It's got to be something real, something for the company. So there's a concept that I've been working on at Riot, um, and it's called indirect player value. And I mentioned this briefly before. Um, the idea that product owners, through no fault of their own, just the position in which they hold, have a tendency to focus mostly on direct player value. I'm going to build a new weapon, a new feature. Um, you know, a, a spectator mode. I'm going to build a new level. I'm going to build this thing. And when I'm done with it, I'm going to ship it to the players, and the players will be happy. And that's great. Love them to death for it. <laughs> They're very valuable for that. But then we have indirect player value. This is your tech debt. This is, you know, your team's ability to be creative. If your team takes 30 minutes to compile and link, your engineers are going to be really slow. If your VFX artists, instead of having a tool, create particle effects with Notepad, seen it, <laughs> they're going to be pretty damn slow. All right? So what we're creating is the concept of the indirect player value champions. Um, these are not product owners. These are not scrum masters. These are people on the team. 
um, quite often uh, technologists, sometimes tech artists or tech designers. Um, the word tech is usually in there simply because uh, people who understand technology tend to have the best view into the workflows and pipelines that people are using on a daily basis. However, there's nothing to stop you from saying, hey, your lead, uh, your lead artist can also be an uh, IPv champion. Now, they keep an IPv backlog. This is a list of stuff, just like the product owner keeps, of things that they want to do in order to optimize the way people are working. They want to burn down tech debt through the execution of their IPv backlog. And then these champions must challenge the product owners. Before sprint, uh, before sprint planning and during sprint planning, they collaborate with them and go, hey, we need to execute on some of this stuff. We need to burn down some of this tech debt. And it's their responsibility, and they're held to that responsibility by their direct manager. How much IPV did you get through this week? How much IPV did you get through over the last two months? These are good questions to ask. And they will need people on their side, most definitely. Um, most organizations are very product owner heavy meaning the company tends to wait in their direction when decisions are being made because the product owner is the owner of direct value to the player. So why wouldn't you naturally tilt in that direction? So these guys are going to need some champions of their own to help them through this. And they work with the POs before and during sprint planning to try to get their backlog items into the sprint. Here's a good rule of thumb. Get buy-in that 20% of your story point velocity will go to IPv backlogs. Or maybe it's 10, maybe it's 15, who knows? It's a negotiation. Just figure it out. Pick something low enough that people won't go, that's unreasonable, but something high enough that you will be able to get some real value coming through that people in a few sprints will start noticing and go, oh, wow, things are getting better. We like this. So, you know, to be able to say at the beginning of a sprint, we're going to take 17 story points and direct all of them to the IPV backlog. That's a good thing. So this is an example of filling up that extra space. Okay? FedEx days. Hey, Danker. Um, this is something that this man up here has actually been uh, driving in the organization um, at Riot. And this is a really cool uh, concept, a great way of trying to fill that extra capacity. Um, and it's simply scheduling a day for outside of the box working. Okay? So again, it's kind of related to the IPV. It's the idea of a person or a group of people are like, you know, I've always wanted to do this thing, but I never have time for it, and I can never get it prioritized high enough to get into a sprint. But for a FedEx day, we're going to tackle this thing. And you can treat a FedEx day as you would any holiday as part of sprint planning. You just pick it up and remove it and say, that's now gone. Um, oh, and I didn't mention, the reason why they call it a FedEx day is because you want to be able to deliver this stuff in one day. Very clever. <laughs> and the Game Jam weekends that the IGDA does, that next one's coming up in January, is actually a form of this, only it's more on the design side of doing these short time boxes where you hand the what and the why over to people on the team. That's what a FedEx day does. It allows you to hand what and why over to the team for a very short set amount of time. Everyone, who here has heard of the Google 20? This is one of the great, uh, one of the great stories that everyone loves. Um, a lot of people think Google invented this concept, um, but uh, the earliest one I've heard of is 3M, the, the little company in uh, Minnesota that makes your Post-it notes. Uh, they started doing this decades ago, and they gave their people 15%. I don't know why they didn't think of 20, because that's one day out of a week and seems a lot easier to schedule. <laughs> but... This is kind of like the ultimate expression of sharing the what and the why with people on your team. And this requires, you know, a lot of skill in an organization to pull off. Now, where a lot of people get this wrong is, is that they don't understand really at its core what the Google 20 is all about. They don't understand that it's a culture, not a rule. When, when I've heard people say this a lot, it's like, why can't we do something like that? Why can't we have something like the, the Google 20? And immediately the conversation starts going towards, are you telling me every single Friday you guys are not going to work on your sprints and you're going to do some other thing? And they immediately start going into who's authoritative in the relationship and how much time is it and which day of the week is it. And they start going into all these details about how they can kind of attach this idea. 
when in fact, it's a massive cultural shift in thinking. And basically, inside of Google, the Google 20 is not protected by the manager, as most people would expect. It's protected by the individual. Because, I mean, it's simply a scale issue. A manager who has 20 direct reports can't possibly protect your Google 20% each week. He wouldn't have enough time. It would be like me trying to organize what was going on out there earlier. Instead, they say, no, we're going to empower the individual. You own your Google 20. It's your responsibility to make sure that you're getting it. Hell, we've already handed planning and execution over to you, right? Through the how of the scrum process. You've already been given a lot of responsibility and authority to make decisions. Exercise it. Make sure that you are getting the Google 20 time that you need for innovation. And at the same time, an individual promises the organization, I will never allow a sprint to fail because I was too busy working on my Google 20. You come into the last day of the sprint, a Friday, and an engineer just says, well, guess we failed because I'm going to work on my thing. That person would be fired. That is a complete violation of what the cultural contract is inside of Google. An individual would never do that. They would never let their team down in that way. And yet, that's what managers tend to be afraid of when they hear this concept. It's like, oh, well, what's going to happen when they, when they take their Friday and we miss a sprint? It's like, you fire the person. <laughs> or you slap them very hard and then re-explain to them, this is the culture. All right? That's the way the culture works, by empowering the individual to own their time of innovation and making sure that they understand, but it comes after the goal that you committed to. And remember, as Clinton Keith would say, they committed to it, all right? It's the beginning of the sprint. If you end up needing to sacrifice your innovation time because you overpromised, guess what? Learning opportunity not to do that because you just lost your innovation time. Be better at planning. You own it now. Much in the same way as I bet when people first started talking about knowledge workers, and started imagining in their own factory, oh my God, 98% of my employees, I'm going to let them manage their own time? It'll be chaos. We'll never get anything done. That's insane. And yet here we are, 80 years later, and that's how we all work, right? It's how we all better be working. It's how we should be working. I believe this is the next evolutionary step in how we work. This is going to be the 21st century. The same transition that went from Taylorism to Deming, we're going to see the same transition to the expansion of the knowledge worker into becoming little entrepreneurs that create emergent brilliance that could never come from a top-down organization. And you'll wind up with people with good ideas banding together and treating your company more like an economic system. And you go to your, and you go to your executive producer and say, hey, if you give me $400,000, me and Bob are going to do this. What do you think? And they're going to go, wow, that's badass. That's where I think we're going. Oh, and a lot of people ask me, why 20%? Why did Google come up with 20%? Because they treat their people as well as they treat their servers. Absolutely true. That was the thinking behind it. Shouldn't we be treated as well as our computers? I would like to think so. So what are some of the problems that you're going to find? I'm talking about a massive cultural shift, not something that's going to be easy. I'm not standing up here claiming that, oh, I've done it. Just come to Riot and you'll see. <laughs> I'm saying this is an idea I have that I am now actively experimenting with, with some of the ideas I was talking about, particularly the IPV backlogs. So some of the problems that I've already started running into and you're going to run into is individuals that simply will not own it. It's a brand new thing. It fights, it conflicts with what they've been taught some, sometimes for their entire lives. They just will not own it. You will see that. You will see managers freaking the hell out. It will scare them in the same way as some manager in a 1920s textile mill was freaked out by the idea of allowing his workers to go to the bathroom when they wanted. And here's a big one. How do you hire enough entrepreneurs to make this work? How do you make that a critical mass? Are there enough entrepreneurs out there? Have we as a society built enough entrepreneurs? And if so, are we all going to spend the next 30 years fighting each other over them? 
One interesting thing that uh, I noticed uh, a couple weeks ago at Riot Games is uh, we had a bunch of technologists um, together, you know, VP of technology and VP of ops and, you know, big people. And looking around the table, it suddenly occurred to me that half of the table either had previously started their own company or currently owned their own company in addition to working at Riot. I thought that was really interesting. And it made me start thinking about a lot of this and thinking, hey, maybe Riot is the kind of company with that level, level of entrepreneurialism that could sustain something like this. And then, big thing here. This is, this is scary, okay? This is a big change. This is a time to teach, okay? People will fall over repeatedly if you try even the simplest version of these things, okay? Don't declare a failure. Instead, pick them back up, walk them through what just happened, try to come up with a new path forward to make sure it doesn't happen again, and keep teaching them. Keep trying to guide them through the process and getting them to own their innovation time, however you want to express it, with, with any of the three tools or probably 100 other processes that you could come up with in order to allow people to own innovation time. But the important thing is that you give them some way. So this is my last slide. These are the big conclusions. I'll go through quickly. Simple, I do not believe that redlining your team is a good idea. I believe that you are losing hidden value that the team could be coming up with, spe specifically by um, sharing the what and the why with them through innovation process and building a culture around making that an important part and an expectation of what you, uh, what you want from all of your people, that, that innovation. And then identifying real-world goals, okay? Don't just separate the time out. Make sure that people are actively filling it with something, something that the organization and that person can be passionate about. And then finally, this ends up empowering the, the totality of the system, as Deming would say. And it allows everyone to take part of the development process, now starting all the way at what and why, which really is the start of all creativity. What are we going to build, and why is it important? And if you go from 10 people at your company to 200 people at your company thinking that way, what new, incredible, emergent brilliance is going to come out of that? That's all I got. Thank you.